Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. December 19th, 2017. Welcome back to the Cooner Report. Jeff Cooner, Boston's bulldozer cleaning up the liberal bull. Okay, 617-266-6868. Later this hour, finally, the parents fight back against Boston's proposal to change school times. But first, this may have been Obama's greatest scandal of all of his scandals. And there are so many, from Obamacare to Fast and Furious to Libya to you name it, across the board, to the IRS, to Benghazi. What's Benghazi? His biggest scandal may have been his administration's determined, dogmatic effort to arm Islamic radicals and empower the mullahs in Tehran. And so, as you know, I've talked about this story for a long time, how Obama had a secret program to send weapons to Islamic rebels in Syria, and how those weapons ended up in the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, our mortal enemies. I've also talked about the disaster of the Iran nuclear deal. Well, now there is a stunning piece in Politico, a center-left liberal publication, so it's not some kind of a right-wing hit job on the dear leader. This is now from a liberal publication that exposes that Obama, behind the scenes, his administration derailed a campaign by the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, to try to prevent Hezbollah, which is essentially an arm of the, of the Iranians, of the Iranian mullahs, to uh, derail their effort to counter their massive drug smuggling and criminal enterprise here in the Western Hemisphere. And in particular, it now appears, and I got to say, this story was incredibly well-sourced. Uh, dozens of interviews, dozens of sources. Uh, this, I mean, they real, they really nailed this baby down. They are even willing to allow Hezbollah to continue to partner with the Latin American drug cartels, especially the Mexican drug cartels, to continue to allow hundreds of millions of dollars of worth of cocaine to continue to flow into the United States. Over 60,000 Americans die every year from drug overdoses. A lot of it is obviously opiates and heroin, but I'll tell you this, a lot of it is also coke. It's also cocaine. And so what this political uh, uh, explosive piece reveals is that the DEA was systematically undermined, blocked, and prevented from continuing with its campaign to try to go after Hezbollah. Hezbollah had set up a huge money laundering drug trafficking empire in Mexico, in Venezuela, and in parts of Latin America. And so the DEA wanted to go after top Hezbollah people, drug smugglers, human traffickers, uh, people who work at some of the key banks, that help launder all of this money, and Obama repeatedly told them no. Or to be more specific, his Justice Department, his Treasury Department, and his State Department repeatedly told them niet. Don't arrest some of the key drug smugglers. Don't arrest some of the key Hezbollah top operatives. Don't sanction some of the key banks. Don't do anything to disrupt their massive drug smuggling operation. Even though, listen to this, Hezbollah was making about a billion dollars a year from all of their cocaine, drug smuggling activities, money laundering, illicit activities, over a billion dollars a year. 
they have formed an alliance with the Mexican drug cartels, and now they're involved in bringing in illegals into the United States. Terrorists are being entered, uh, 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 were, were being brought into the United States, and cocaine in huge numbers, by the tons and tons of it, were being poured into the United States. And rather than crack down on this, the Obama administration told the DEA, leave Hezbollah alone. And the reason why, according to the political piece, everything had to be subordinated to making sure that he got his deal with the Iranians. The crown jewel of his foreign policy. The crown jewel of Jean-Francois Kerry, uh, the secre- then Obama Secretary of State, of his foreign policy. And so they were so desperate to appease the mullahs, to get any kind of a deal with the Iranians, that we turned on our own DEA. We blocked and undermined our own DEA from going after Hezbollah and Latin American drug smugglers who were bringing in God knows how much cocaine into our country. Now I want you to think about this. This is not speculation. This is not just Jeff Cooner, you know, well, maybe they killed Americans, maybe they didn't kill Americans. It was the Iranians who backed Islamist Shiite militias who blew up our barricades in Lebanon, in Beirut, killing hundreds of American Marines. This is the same Hezbollah that planted improvised explosive devices, IEDs, all across Iraq, killing, maiming, and crippling American soldiers for years. This is the same Hezbollah that blew up a Jewish synagogue in Buenos Aires. This is the same Hezbollah uh, that has essentially now taken over Lebanon and is now part of Iran's effort to create a new Persian empire all across the Middle East. And you're sitting there? And you're siding with Hezbollah? You're siding with Tehran? You're siding with the Iranian mullahs? against our own Drug Enforcement Administration. And you would rather allow this drug smuggling to continue and for cocaine to continue to poison our children, our schools, our neighborhoods, our streets, have Americans die from cocaine, than to have, than to have it become an issue that could eventually potentially sabotage and blow up his negotiations with the Iranian mullahs and get his coveted nuclear deal? A nuclear deal, by the way, that we have now found out had so many secret side deals to it? Hundreds of millions of dollars sent in cash? $150 billion being repatriated to the mullahs in Iran, which, by the way, we now know they have been using to build up their military, build up their nuclear program, build up their ballistic missiles. He turned Iran into a major power. He nuked up the mullahs. And he didn't just nuke up the mullahs. He gave them $150 billion to finance their terrorism all across the world. And he sided with a foreign power against his own citizens? Are you kidding me? Now, I don't know how any liberal, I don't care how, I I don't know how any progressive, I don't know how any Democrat can agree with this. This to me is what is mind-blowing here. How do you, in good conscience, support or endorse or endorse this? And to me, this goes now to the heart of the matter. What was it with Obama's obsession with the Muslim world? Because you look at Trump's national security strategy, like I talked about in the last hour, and all it was is America first, patriotism, pride, and projecting American power. American exceptionalism is back. 
And yet this was the same president, Obama, in contrast, who all he did was apologize for the United States, insult the United States on foreign soil, criticize the United States on foreign soil. As he put it, America is exceptional. Yes, the way Greece is exceptional. The way France is exceptional. The way Hungary is exceptional. The way other countries in the world are exceptional. Really? Really? With all due respect to the Greeks, and they know I love them, you're going to compare Greece, which has now become an economic socialist basket case. Socialism has essentially killed Greece to the greatest constitutional republic in the history of the world? The country that almost single-handedly defeated Nazism and communism? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Really, you're kidding me. Like, what planet are you living on? He had, a, he had this obsession with arming radical Islam, with putting Islamic regimes in power, whether it be in Egypt, whether it be in Syria, whether it be in Tunisia, whether it be all across North Africa and the Middle East. And he was obsessed with nuking up and empowering the Iranian mullahs. And my theory, and it's just my theory, is I think at his core, being a cultural Muslim, uh, uh, raised in Indonesia, with a Muslim father and then a Muslim stepfather, somebody who himself admitted in an interview with Nicholas Kristof after he was elected president, the greatest sound I have ever heard is the call of the Azan, the Muslim call to prayer. A man who could recite uh, prayers, Muslim prayers in perfect Arabic. I believe that he was so full of loathing for Western civilization, for the United States, and he was such an anti-Semitic Jew-hater that his goal was to give the Muslim world the nuclear bomb. And I think, essentially, he achieved it. Under his watch, for the most part now, Iran is a threshold nuclear state. And his goal was to sell Israel and America down the river. And so we had a fifth columnist, a traitor in the White House. And to me, when you look at all of the evidence now, the disastrous Iranian deal, deliberately turning a blind eye to ISIS, in fact, mocking everybody, calling it the, JZ, the JV team, a secret CIA program to send weapons to Islamic rebels in Syria that we know went into the hands of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And now we find out handcuffing your own uh, uh, drug enforcement administration and telling, preventing them from successfully prosecuting and investigating Hezbollah and a billion-dollar criminal syndicate in which they were pouring in drugs, cocaine in particular, into the United States. So you would rather have Americans die of cocaine than go after Hezbollah? If that doesn't send a chill down your spine, if that doesn't make the hair on your neck stand, if that doesn't make you realize what a Judas Islamist fifth columnist we had, in the White House. You see, the difference between Trump and Obama is very simple. Obama put America last. Trump put Ameri puts America first. Let me repeat that. Obama put America last. Trump puts America first. Obama appeased and coddled and empowered radical Islam. Trump wants to stand up and destroy and defeat radical Islam. There is a movie that's going to be coming out this Friday. I have next week off. It's the Christmas holidays. During those Christmas holidays, I don't know when, 
but one day I'm going to head off to Patriot Place, and I'm going to go see it. I may even drag my little Ashton with me, although I don't think he's going to understand much in it, but I'd like for him to at least starting to get a little acculturated to history, politics, uh, and what the world was like before he was born. It's called The Darkest Hour. It stars Gary Oldman, who I, I'm hearing does apparently an incredible performance as Winston Churchill. And it is the story of Churchill as he desperately sought to rally Great Britain in the West against Hitler's Germany. In the West's darkest hour, we had a champion, unlike Neville Chamberlain. With the West's back against the wall, Churchill vowed never surrender. Never, never, never surrender. Obama was Neville Chamberlain. Trump, apparently last night, had a screening of that movie to certain Republicans in Congress. He's a great admirer of Churchill. My friends, we've been asking for a warrior in the White House for a long time. Under the president, we finally have one. And I say, God bless him. 617-266-6868. Why did Obama empower Hezbollah? And why do you believe he prevented our own DEA from investigating and prosecuting their drug smuggling operation? Did Obama commit treason? 617-266-6868. Your calls next. Yeah, baby! <laughs> Yeah, baby! Ha <laughs> ha! Okay, uh, 20 seconds left to vote, but essentially it's a done deal. The Republicans in the House, it's still got to go to the Senate, but House Republicans have now passed the historic tax reform bill. Yes, baby! Uh, 227 yay, 203 nay. 12 Republicans voted against it, 227 voted for it. All the Democrats, 190, I'm sorry, 191 of them voted against it. So uh, the Democrats opposed it on block, 12 Republicans as well, but it wasn't enough to stop it. 227 votes, it is now over the top, it now goes to the Senate, which means... If the Senate should pass it, and it looks like they have the votes, uh, Christmas is coming early. Everybody's going to get a tax cut. This is going to, I mean, turbocharge the economy. You are going to see economic growth like we have not seen in 20 to 25 years. And this time, the Democrats are going to go down as the party of no. They just signed their own political death warrant. Yes, baby. Okay. We're halfway there. Freddie and Beverly, go ahead, Freddie. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for taking my call. My you pleasure. Know, it's just amazing when you listen to people who still believe in this guy, President Obama, um, former President Obama, and still think he had no major scandals and everything. And you see how everything he did from the moment he got in office was to undermine everything that went on in this country. And you'd see how um, even uh, how he definitely was more leaning towards uh, being a Muslim than actually Christianity when he accidentally, while being interviewed by George Stephanos, Muslim faith, and then he would constantly criticize Christians for any little thing that they did. If they, um, if, if they burped or whatever, he would be all over it. He'd criticize the Bible, but if, if something happened where Muslims killed lots of people, he would never dare criticize them, never say anything about it. But it was always criticizing Christians, and he would even cover if he gave a speech in front of anything that looked like a Christian symbol, he would have it covered. He would have a cross covered or something like that because Sharia law says that you have to do that. So the Freddie, guy did all kinds of things to prove that he, would, he never embraced this country and he never really embraced Christianity from the way he behaved. Oh, he hated he did us. He everything he could to undermine this country and undermine this, and undermine this president that's there. You know he's behind everything that's going on on his way out the door. What does he do? He makes it easier for the intelligence agencies to share 
their intelligence in that way. He knew what was coming. He knew what they were going to try to do to Trump, and he was preparing for that to happen. Freddie, I, I forget who was beheaded, but do you remember there was a savage beheading? ISIS committed James Foley. Yes, Brittany, excellent. James Foley was savagely beheaded, and then Trump, sorry, Obama, Trump mocked him for this, but Obama uh, told the press corps, gave a, a, a press conference where he was chastising Christians. You remember that? So mm -hmm. Islamic terrorists behead this guy in a gruesome graphic video, and he's lecturing Christians saying, oh, you get off your high horses, you know, a thousand years ago during the Crusades, uh, you guys committed your own fair share of atrocities. Right, he talks about atrocities that happened uh, centuries ago with Christians, but he ignores what happens today with Muslims, and he also has the nerve, he calls the Koran the Holy Koran, but he criticizes the Bible. I remember he talked about the Bible in a mocking way. Well, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. He has no respect for the Bible, and he has no respect for Christianity. Uh, Freddie, I think it's going to come out eventually that this guy was at a minimum a cultural Muslim and most likely a closet Muslim whose goal it was was to bring America and the West to its knees. Like I said, if I'm a Muslim in some cave in Afghanistan, it's not just the Prophet Muhammad. It's Allah, Allah, Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Obama. So I pray to Mecca, and then I put my rug to Washington and thank the dear leader. Because honestly, nobody did more for them since the time of Prophet Muhammad. 617-266-6868. Okay. The historic tax vote, uh, it's passed now by the Republicans, is now causing protests up on Capitol Hill. The snowflakes are melting down. Evan Heidenrich has the latest in the RKO newsroom. Take it away, Evan. It's about time somebody started kicking Tommy Chang's rear end. Okay, my friends, a drop kick him in the butt. 617 266 6868 is the number. Look, I'll tell you this about the Cooner Man. They love me now in Roslindale. I mean, they weren't big fans of me before. But now, after I sounded the alarm about the changes to the Boston Public Schools school time, uh, I got to tell you, in Roslindale in particular, they're starting to like the Cooner Man. So, finally, finally, the parents are standing up to the education bureaucrats. And in particular, uh, as I discussed earlier, la no, later last week, was it last week, Brittany, or... Yeah, it was last week. We discussed this last week, whereby Superintendent Tommy Chang, Mr. $257,000 a year on a five-year contract, what this guy does is beyond me, except, you know, basically screw up everybody's life, okay? So Tommy and the school committee decided they're going to change the school times for all Boston public schools. And so for the elementary and mid-school students, those in middle school, uh, most of them are going to start before 8 o'clock. Uh, some of those schools actually as early as 7.15 in the morning. And for high schools, uh, many of them are going to continue to be open at 8.30. However, some other high schools are going to get pushed back. Their starting time is going to be 9.30. And so, obviously, many parents are furious, especially those of the, the younger munchkins, those in elementary school, especially parents who have two or three kids, saying, well, number one, we're going to have to have our kids going to the bus in pitch darkness. That's number one. Number two, who starts a school day at 7.15 or 7.30? They're going to be completely exhausted. They're not going to be able to concentrate. They're not going to be productive. And then classes will end, the school day will end at about 1.15 or 1.30, which means child care or after programs are going to be so expensive because these poor parents don't finish work until 4.30 or 5. So they're going to have to be paying for three, four hours of uh, child care or after school programs. 
It's going to do nothing to enhance educational performance. It's going to be a tremendous burden on parents. It's going to actually make it unsafe for a lot of the kids, especially in the morning when it's very dark outside. And it's going to cost the parents a bomb. And so last night, they uh, hundreds of parents finally stood up to the school committee. Almost nobody supported the school change time. And they gave, uh, they gave the school committee members a piece of their mind. And the question they kept asking again and again is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the only good reason that the committee could give, and uh, Tommy, Tommy Chang, Tommy Boy could give, was, well, all the busing, the kids, it, we could save about $7 million. If we change the start times... You know, when the schools start and when they end, uh, we think we can save about seven mil. You want to, so you can make $257,000 a year. You guys give yourself all kinds of incredible pay packages, but now you're quibbling over $7 million on the backs of the students and the parents who, you know, pay for the schools, pay for your salary, Tommy. They're the ones who, in fact, subsidize and, 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 and their tax money goes to fund all of these schools. There was one mother who rose up. It was actually very emotional. She has a seven-year-old child in school. She is a pregnant woman with a second child on the way. And as she told the committee... My daughter now, because her the, the time for her school, for her daughter's school, has been moved up, according to these changes, to 7.15. So my daughter now is going to have to get up way before 6 o'clock. She's going to have to go out in the dark, wait for a school bus. Uh, she's not safe. It's pitch black. In fact, I don't know about you. Today, I had to drive in early. It's a long story. I had to do a follow-up for a laser procedure on one of my eyes. Anyway... So I left the house just before 6 o'clock. It's pitch black out there. Like, I know maybe Tommy doesn't like to get up early in the morning, but, you know, Tommy, try getting up at about, ooh, 6.15, 6.30, 6.45, when it's winter here in Boston, and take a look outside, Tommy. Because when you look outside, it's, it's pitch black. So now she has to worry about her daughter going, arriving to school safely, She's got a baby on the way. She has to work along with her husband because you need two incomes now to pay the bills, put a roof over your head, put food on the table. She cannot afford having her daughter spend four hours in an aftercare program five days a week, especially with another one on the way. And so this poor pregnant mother had to stand there and beg the committee, beg them not to change the school times. Is this a dictatorship or is this a democracy? And when everything was said and done, they lined up one parent after another. They were emotional, but for the most part, they were respectful, they were civil, they were articulate, they were very intelligent, obviously very concerned, and they listed reason after reason after reason after reason why this was a horrible idea. And when everything was said and done, they just adjourned the meeting. And when they, so the parents shouted out, whoa, 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 what about our complaints? Are you still going to go ahead with this change in the school times? And their answer was, we'll see. Literally, we'll see. We'll take it up with Tommy Chang. We'll take it up with Tommy. Now, the problem is this, as all the parents were complaining, rightfully so, registration for next year, because this is going to start in the fall of 2018, registration is in early January. January 3rd, January 4th, whatever it is. It's in early January. By the time they take this up with Tommy, it's going to be... January 20th is when Tommy says he may take this up, and he'll see. He and Marty Walsh say they'll see whether they'll keep the new times or go back to the old times. 
Well, by then, the kids have already registered. So now you're just sowing chaos into the system. And so basically what the parents felt was they let us vent for a couple of hours, even though we told them we don't want this. It's bad for our children. It's bad for their education. It's bad for our pocketbook. It's going to put undue strain and burden on all of us. The previous system was fine. There was no reason to do this. They basically got the back of the hand. Basically, what the school committee told them was, blank you. And we'll take it up with Macho Marty and good old Tommy. And if Tommy Boy and Macho Marty, they may want to change a little bit, or maybe they won't change anything, or maybe they'll continue with the changes, because, you know, hey, baby, this is Mark Massachusetts. And this is, hey, you're just a bunch of peons. So shut up, go to work, pay your taxes, and don't complain. It's not your child. It's the government's child. That's the arrogance. That's the presumption that is driving all of this. That it's ultimately, these are Tommy Chang's children. These are Marty Walsh's children. This is the government. It's not your child. It's the government's child. No, listen, when if we want your little Jimmy or Jenny to start at 7.15, shut up and send little Jimmy or Jenny there till, uh, seven, at 7.15 sharp. And for the high school students, those that are going to be starting school at 8.30 or 9, or God forbid for some of them, 9.30, hey, if they're going to be up till midnight, that's your problem. We, we call the shots here. The condescending arrogance... The utter disdain for the hardworking, taxpaying parents is to me, honestly, it's despicable. It really is. And you know, what's really sad is that they were all peaceful. They were all civil. Yes, emotional. I don't blame them. And they just walked out feeling utterly helpless and powerless. You're the taxpayer. Tommy Chang works for you. You pay his salary. Marty Walsh works for you. The school committee, they work for you. And so uh, my strong advice to the parents in Roslindale or wherever it is, okay, all across Boston, I think a Q&A is too civilized for them. I really do. I think for you to tell them how bad this proposal is, how unnecessary this proposal is, how burdensome and inconvenient this proposal is, how wrong this proposal is, it's not enough for them. You don't, what you got to do now, trust me when I tell you this, you have to get a picket, you got to get a sign, you have to go either to your school or go straight to Tommy Chang's building and protest. You're going to have to protest. And what you're going to have to tell them is, we are not going to pay our taxes, or we are not, for a while, we're not going to send our kids to school, whatever it is, you have to put the threat of either a tax revolt or an actual boycott. I know it's your kids, I know it's a public school, I know you want them to go to school, I know you have jobs to do, but you have to eventually tell them, look, you work for us, we don't work for you. And so, hopefully, saner minds will prevail. But my suspicion is, Tommy Chang and Marty Walsh, they need the money. They need the money. And to all of you in Roslindale, I've been saying this now for a long time, if they didn't have illegal aliens flooding the city of Boston... If Marty Walsh wasn't telling them, hey, hey, come into my office in City Hall, no problem. If they weren't in the city of Boston with the welfare and the EBT and the Section 8 housing and the food stamps, and yes, crowding our schools, that $7 million wouldn't be a problem. That's the cost of illegal immigration. And you know who they're passing off the cost to? A you. And it's about time you said enough is enough. We're the taxpayers. We're the makers. It's our schools. 
you don't change the times without our consent or our approval. And if you don't like it, fire Tommy Boy. 617-266-6868. Lines are loaded. John in Malden. Go ahead, John. Hey, Jeff. Hey, uh, I got an easy solution. Why don't the mothers protest by bringing, bringing the kids in at the regular same time as they are now? If they start at 715. That's exactly what I'm big, urging them to do. That'll make a big statement. That'll make a big statement right there. John, uh, buddy, you're, you're a genius. That's exactly what I think they should do. Yeah. So they, if, they, if the start they, time they is 830. If they start at 8 o'clock, bring them in at 8 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. Oh, 715 is fully here. Oh, no, sorry, 8 o'clock. That'd be the biggest statement for all the mothers out there that should protest and, and our fathers to bring them in at 8 o'clock. They start at 8 o'clock. Never mind the 715 crap because... For the small kids, that's too early. So I can understand the, uh, the the seniors and stuff. I'll start a little later. I can understand that. But when it comes to the little kids, no. Nah, that's, too, that's too early. John, don't get me wrong. I only have eyes for my wife. I love you. In a, In non-sexual, a non-sexual way. way. <laughs> I love you, my friend. Same here, Jeff. Thank you for that call, buddy. No, he nailed it. So if the school, the start time is 830, okay? They roll it back, say, 7.30 or 7.15. To all the parents, if they're not going to listen to you, drop them off at 8.30. And then when, let's say, oh, but then the, the, end, the closing time, whatever, the end of the day is, let's say, 1.15 or 1.30. Don't pick them up. I'm serious. Say, no, no. What was the school day before? 8.30 to 3.30? Okay. Whatever, 8.30 to 2.30? No problem. Pick them up at 2.30. Or aftercare at 2.30. Whatever. That's it. Believe me, you do this as a group en masse, you will bring the school system to its knees. And you will force Marty Walsh and Tommy Chang to listen to you, the people, the taxpayers, the owners of the schools. 617-266-6868. Agree, disagree, your calls. Next. 255 here on the great WRKO. Okay, the parents finally fight back in a heated school committee hearing yesterday. Angry parents showed up saying they do not want Boston Public Schools to change their start times. In particular, for elementary and middle school students, uh, they now want to change the start time to 7.30, even 7.15 in the morning. The parents say it's way too early. The kids are going to be too exhausted. They won't be able to concentrate. It's not even safe for them to go for the bus. And when it ends at 1.15 or 1.30, the school day, the after-school programs, the child care, because they're going to be there for so many hours, will be so expensive, the parents cannot afford it. Frank in the back bay. Go ahead, Frank. I couldn't agree with you more, Jeff, and I wanted to make three points. First off, this arrogance and haughtiness is seeping into all levels of government, local, city, federal. They think they know better than the people closest to the issue, which in this case are parents. Secondly, it's the continued drumbeat of discrimination against working people. Let's raise the gas tax. Let's raise the tolls. Let's screw around with the start time from schools. Who who really feels the impact and the dramatic impact of that on our lives? Working mothers and fathers. And thirdly, where is our esteemed uh, Senator, uh, Senators Warren and Markey and our Congressman, you know, Kennedy? If this were a splinter group protesting against uh, something, they would be all in saying how egregious this transgression was and we should stop it. The, the silence is deafening. And I'll, I'll throw Paul Duvall in that group, too. Why is our governor making a statement on this thing? But keep banging on this, Jeff, because if you can, you know, get people to do indeed make it, take a stand on this, because this is fundamental. This is about a democracy, not simply uh, a one-off. This is something about controlling what impacts our lives on a daily basis. Thanks for doing what you do. Uh, Frank, uh, can I ask you a personal question, my friend? Yes, sir. Have you ever done talk radio in your life? 
No, but I. this is a long time first time, Jeff. I uh, thoroughly enjoy listening to you and others. You make my day. Thank you. Well, Frank, you should, because th- that was very good. God bless you, you, my so friend. Much. Take care. Thank you so much. Uh, look, I mean, uh, what can I say? He said it better than I could say it. I mean, really, I could have said it better myself. This is an issue fundamentally about democracy versus the elites. And it's exactly what Frank said. Whether it be state government, Beacon Hill, all the corruption up there, the federal government, the establishment, the swamp, who rules? Who rules? Who governs? The people or the elites? The citizens, the taxpayers, or the makers and the moochers? That's what this is fundamentally all about. So I think somebody now needs to teach Macho Marty Walsh and Tommy Chang, good old Tommy, Tommy boy, a lesson. I'm sorry, you don't control our kids. You don't own our kids. And, you know, it's not just that the parents don't want it. The kids don't want it. The teachers don't want it. The principals don't want it. Nobody wants it. So, to me, this is almost like a populist issue of local control. You know, Tommy, I'll tell you what, $257,000 a year, do me a favor, do nothing. Do nothing. I'd rather you just do nothing and collect $257,000 a year than you go in there and mess up everybody's life and everybody's schedule. Okay, my friends, uh, I need another hour. I got to go. Jeff Cooner, Boston's bulldozer, and together we're cleaning up the liberal bull. The voice of Boston is you. On 680 WRKO Boston, an iHeart Radio station. It's 3 o'clock. Running a small business can be demanding. The more you grow.